So hello everybody, I hope you're all well. Um, I would like to thank you uh, for joining us tonight. We're very excited um, to present um, this event um, and to share the stories and uh, feedbacks of five new and very talented PIs. Um, and I would like to thank them very warmly for accepting to participate. So um, the five PIs that uh, are going to talk tonight are first uh, Anna Blackney from the University of British Columbia, Nora Fogarty from King's College London, David Gerschlich from Cambridge University, Philip Schiffer, who is our German representative for the night from University of Cologne, and finally Ines Tekera from uh, Queen Mary University. So um, this presentation will be followed by a Q&A session and you'll be able to write your questions on the tool that should uh, appear on your screen or on your app. Uh, and um, I'll be able to read the questions when the Q&A session starts and the PIs will be able to share their insights and discuss. And we want the event to be informal, so don't hesitate to, po to ask any questions. So very briefly, uh, before starting the event, uh, I wanted to present the London Postdoc Network. Um, so um, this uh, network was created recently, so it's a two-month-old um, network, and um, we have representatives in the in the different London universities, and our aim is to provide the postdoc communities, also PhDs, with career events through feedback events, like the one that we are organizing now about career in academia, but also workshops. For example, hard and soft skills workshops, uh, business related or not. Um, so if you want to be informed uh, and be keeping tuned about our events, please, you can follow us on our different socials. So we have a website, londonpostdocnetwork.com, but also you can follow us on Twitter or join our LinkedIn group, London Postdoc Network. So the event is going to be recorded and available on our YouTube channel. So I think this is all I wanted to say. Um, I will hand it over to Anna. Sorry again for um, the technical glitch, uh, and I should reappear for the Q&A session. I will now stop sharing my screen. Oh no, now, now you're on, Anna. Okay. Okay, can everybody um, hear me okay and see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent, thanks guys. All right, um, so I'm really excited to be presenting to you, to guy, to you guys tonight. Thanks everybody for attending. Um, as Jean-Francois said during the introduction, I'm Dr. Anna Blakeney, and I'm actually still a postdoc at Imperial College, but I will uh, be starting as an assistant professor at University of British Columbia um, in January of 2021. So I just have a few slides to share just kind of on my advice and how I became a PI um, to kind of start off the night. So um, first, I just wanted to go through my career path. So I always felt this was kind of helpful seeing what other people had done and um, kind of uh, the paths that other people had taken when I was thinking about staying in academia. Um, so I thought this would be a helpful first thing to share. So I actually did my uh, bachelor's degree in Colorado at the University of Colorado in chemical and biological engineering. Um, I graduated from there in 2012. I then went on to do my PhD in bioengineering, uh, primarily at the University of Washington in Seattle, but I did six months of my PhD at the University of Cape Town in South Africa as part of a fellowship. Um, so I graduated from there in 2016, um, and at that time I received a fellowship from the Whitaker Foundation, which is specifically a fellowship that's for Americans to use for a postdoc outside of the states. Uh, so you have to apply with a certain lab. So I, I applied with Robin Shattuck at Imperial College London um, and moved over to London in 2016. That 
was a two-year fellowship originally. While I was in the lab, I applied for a Marie Curie fellowship um, and was awarded that. And I am split between Robin Shattuck and Molly Stevens labs at Imperial College London. Um, so from there, I um, then yeah applied for jobs and I'll talk a little bit about how I did that and how I decided on where to apply and um, what jobs and I actually ended up getting an assistant professor position at University of British Columbia um, and I have a joint appointment between the Michael Smith labs and the School of Biomedical Engineering. Okay so another thing that I always thought was really helpful to know was just how people applied and where they applied and kind of how this all goes. So for those of you who are familiar um, with the um, uh, kind of process, so usually you send out applications to lots of different places depending on kind of where you want to be. So I applied for 11 different positions that were advertised. Um, and I specifically wanted to apply in the US, but I also applied for a position or positions in Canada and Hong Kong. Um, so I applied for a total of 11 applications. Uh, the next step was then I did six video interviews. So I think this is especially common um, just to kind of get a feel for the applicants who are um, applying and just to kind of get to know the committee. After that, I was invited for four in-person interviews and I, um, two of which were in the US, one in Canada and then one in Hong Kong. And my one in Hong Kong actually was originally um, postponed because of the protest there and then because of COVID and then rescheduled. And um, at first there was a travel restriction for residents of the UK to go there and then it was um, uh, the UK was on lockdown. So yeah so i didn't and i only ended up going to three of my in-person interviews that i was invited for um, and then i ended up getting three job offers from that um so i guess my advice here is it's good to cast a wide net um i, I applied to 11 a lot of people i know apply to even more than that um so it kind of just depends on where you want to be and what what departments are looking for at the time for sure um, so they asked us to talk a little bit about publishing, and I think this is a really fascinating topic. So I kind of just have like three pieces of advice. So uh, when I was, um, I guess I always kind of view it for my work, which is more um, in engineering, but now I work in a primarily immunology lab. So um, when I was doing my PhD, I think I focused a lot more on um, this balance of getting out a lot more papers as opposed to like more higher tier journal um, papers. So it, it, it's always this balance of, you know, waiting and saving up more experiments and more and more work to publish in a higher tier journal. I think during my PhD, I just um, published a lot more papers, so a higher quantity, whereas in my postdoc, I try to just um, kind of focus on a few main projects instead of just lots of different projects, um, but it's always balanced. So I've kind of gotten feedback both ways where that it's good to um, be able to have a lot of papers, um, but also you need to be able to publish high impact work. So I would say it's, it's really just a balance. You you probably need to be doing both, um, but I think the stage at your in your career that you do that at really depends, but also depends on your field. Um, so some of the main feedback that I got while I was interviewing for positions was really just about this trajectory. So um, people like asked me for this a lot and brought this up a lot, but just about how often you're publishing and or getting cited. And so I think this is um, something that people are really concerned with just to make sure that, you know, you're productive during your PhD, you continue to be productive during your postdoc, and then theoretically that trajectory will continue once you're a PI. Um, so this is something, something to think about just, you know, how often are you publishing and are you doing this consistently um, throughout all of your different steps? Um, and yeah, so another another thing that I think is really interesting is just how do you decide what journals to publish in? So obviously impact factor um, is a good starting place. I guess the use of impact factor is really before you publish there, it's a good way to gauge, I guess, theoretically how many times um, each uh, paper that's published there is cited on average. 
Um, so that's a good place to start, but how I generally do it is just what journals are publishing papers that I really like to read um, so that I find really well done and are just kind of publishing kind of cutting edge stuff. So these are a few in my field that I really like. So molecular therapy and ACS Dano I think are really good journals. Um, so that's usually how I kind of decide. But obviously, I think just, yeah, the, the idea of an impact factor is kind of a, a contentious debate all the time, um, but I think it still is valued by a lot of people and so um, should be taken into consideration. Um, so yeah, so obviously my job hunt and applications have a have been a lot more North American centric, um, but I have just kind of some basic advice when you're thinking about applying to positions and also deciding on positions and I can kind of walk you through how I made these decisions. So um, the first one is what is the startup package like? So this is one of the main draws, I guess, for me to apply to positions in North America is that they usually come up with a much better um, startup package. So I guess people, depending on what field and department you're in, um, typically expect to have around a million dollars of in their startup package. Um, whereas I know in the UK and other places in, in Europe, um, it's much less than that. So it just makes it nicer when you're starting out because there's not as much pressure immediately to get grants. Um, the idea is that um, you can, you know, suffice for a few years on just the, the funds that you're given in your startup package. Um, another thing to consider is what will your teaching duties be? Um, so this uh, more varies, I think, from like more science and engineering departments. So oftentimes in engineering departments, you'll have to teach two to three classes a year, um, which is a lot of teaching. So um, it's always good to look for opportunities where you'll have, I guess, kind of fewer te teaching obligations to begin with. Um, so as far as if there's opportunities to apply for funding to buy yourself out of teaching or um, I mean, if you really if you really like that, that's great as well. It just it can take a lot of time, especially when you are um, just getting started and trying to start up a research lab. Um, so uh, another thing that's really important to me is what is a normal work life balance in the department? Um, so, you know, are people taking holidays? Do they work all hours of the day? Um, and I think there's, again, a really good balance here. Um, I like to be surrounded by people who are really passionate and like what they're doing and, you know, want to be at work, but aren't completely workaholics. Um, another thing to ask about is, uh, are you expected to cover your salary and how much do students and postdocs cost? Um, so this is really just, I put an icon here of like stretching a rubber band, but it's just how much will you have to stretch your funding? So if you're expected to cover all of your salary, and you know, um, at some institutions you have to pay tuition for your students or, or um, stuff like that. So just to be aware of how much money you're theoretically getting and then how much everything is going to cost, um, just because sometimes it, it, it can be quite a burden to be supporting your salary as well as the salary of everybody around you. Oops. Um, and then my last one is just what is the quality of students? So obviously being a kind of higher tier organ institutions just makes it a lot easier easier to recruit um, really good and engaged students and you know we really just yeah when you have a lab it's not you doing the work anymore so you need to be at a place where you are getting really good students and um, usually that's yeah at, the better the institution is it's kind of just easier to recruit people like that although that's not always true um, anyway, so yeah, but kind of my last pieces of advice that I wanted to give um, and these icons will make sense in a second. So uh, the first one is an alien just because I, th I think of myself as kind of an alien in my current postdoc position um, just because my all of my training is in engineering. Um, but I'm now just surrounded by immunologists so, like I'm the only engineer in the group. Um, which is tough at first just because I came in as a postdoc, but obviously knew a lot less than some of the PhD students. So it was a lot of learning, um, but I think that's really good. It's kind of one of the last opportunities that you have in your career to, to learn that much more and really start doing a completely new thing. And I think it also helps you just establish a new niche that is kind of, um, yeah, just a natural new niche. So, and I think this is something that's really good when you're applying for a position, just as establishing yourself as your own lab and what's gonna be different from your current PI. Um, another thing that really helped me um, and 
that actually I used the resources at Imperial a lot for was just getting feedback. So I got feedback on basically every stage of applying. So they um, there's a postdoc center at Imperial that's really, really helpful. Um, and a lot of institutions have uh, centers like this, but they'll look over your CV and just kind of com they completely revamped mine just um, to make it. Ki it's kind of different when you're a PhD student um, or a postdoc transitioning into a PI, like they just value things differently. So um, they did that for me, which was super helpful. They looked over all of my application materials and um, they're really good just because they see, you know, hundreds of these. And so they they've seen it all and um, they're they're really good at just going through and saying, OK, you need to have X, X and X um, and really kind of tuning it that way. Um, and I also did a, a mock interview with the postdoc center here, which was good just because I had never really done um, an interview like this before. Um, they're often, yeah, I guess the ones that I went to, my one for UBC was two full days starting at 8 a.m. both days, and then I had meetings all day until 5 p.m. And so when you're in back-to-back -back meetings like that and then you know giving a chalk talk and a presentation, it's quite a lot. And so it's good to just practice that before you actually have to do it. Um, I got this advice along the way and I, I tell pretty much everybody this now is to create a website for yourself um, and so this just really helps to give you visibility within the world of science and kind of give you legitimacy as well. Um, so uh, it's pretty easy to set up. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot of sites like WordPress and stuff like that where you can just easily do this in an afternoon if you wanted to, um, but it just helps it. it when there's so many applicants for um, one position, if someone is just able to Google you and quickly find out who you are, um, I think that's really advantageous. Um, and so the last thing I, I have to say is uh, that I really recommend to reach out to departments before applying. So this is good in two different ways. So um, one, I would just reach out to either the chair of the committee, um, the recruitment committee, or the even to the, the head of the department just to ask um, like if they're looking for you know the type someone who does the type of research that you do and I think this also helps because it just flags you as somebody who is engaged and really interested and then when they're looking through these piles of applications they'll recognize your name um, so that was some advice I got and I, I think it also worked out well for me so um, that's kind of it. I think we're having a Q&A at the end, so I won't take any questions now, but if you guys have any questions about the process in particular, uh, feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to answer questions. And with that, I will pass it on to Nora. Um, good evening. Uh, thanks to the organisers for inviting me here this evening. Um, it's really nice to be able to share some of my experiences. Um, and I think um, I follow quite nicely from Anna because she's been talking about applying for positions um, such as um, lectureships and professorships, whereas the route that I've gone down in my transition to independence has been going down the, the fellowship application route. So, um, um, so a slightly a slightly different process and different advice that I can pass on. Um, so in terms of my career, I did my um, my undergraduate degree in Trinity College Dublin, and in 2013 I moved to um, no I, I did my undergrad um, uh, in Trinity in Dublin, and then I moved to Cambridge to do my PhD and that was in um, placenta biology. And then in 2013, I moved to Cathy Neocon's lab, um, which was initially at the National Institute for Medical Research at the NIMR, um, which then subsequently um, uh, moved over to the, the Francis Crick Institute. And there I was looking at um, uh, human embryo development, um, specifically looking at the cells that will give rise to the to the placenta. Um, so um, during my my postdoc, I had um, a couple of um, quite of, of, of high impact papers and and um, uh, interesting collaborations. Um, probably my my most uh, my highest impact work was the work that I did in pioneering CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing as a as a tool to be used in in human embryo research and. Um, 
kind of off the back of that or while that that work was was fresh in people's minds I then began to reach out to host institutes um, to to see where I could begin um, establishing my group and also so with the in terms of talking about um, high impact publications it kind of coincided that I had this high impact paper um, when I also had about 18 months left on my postdoc contract so kind of the timing coincided with the with the, the publication um, and what I did initially was I so when I was thinking about where I wanted to set up my group um, I decided that I wanted to stay in, in London um, primarily for for family reasons but also I knew I wanted to stay in the UK anyway because um, I was continuing my research in human embryos and the UK is in my opinion the best place in the world to do this kind of research because we have um, the legislation is in place so I kind of had Na a very narrow focus on, on where I wanted to stay. Um, and so with that, I uh, reached out to um, the director of the Stem Cell Institute at um, or the Centre for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine at King's College and kind of just cold emailed um, Fiona Watt uh, along with my CV and a cover letter. And um, after meeting with Fiona, she was um, really um, enthusiastic about supporting uh, any applications that I would make um, for fellowships. And so I began to uh, prepare an application for the, the Henry Dale. So this is with the Wellcome Trust. And um, uh, as I was uh, preparing this application and so I, the, the preliminary one was, was grand and then I got through to the uh, to the, the the next round where I would be invited to submit a, a full application. Um, however, um, I had a I was pregnant at the time and my baby arrived early, so I had to defer that application. So I then took a year maternity leave, and while I was on maternity leave, I was continuing. So I deferred the application. I kind of put the application on ice while I could um, get my head around having a newborn and and um, all that that entails, um, and kind of gave myself a few months break. But then I came back to 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 preparing these applications, and so in the meantime, I applied for the the King's Prize Fellowship, which is um, like they describe it as a, a springboard fellowship. So it gives you two years of funding um, for my salary and a small amount of money for, for research consumables. So that um, King's Prize Fellowship is what I'm on now. It kind of has allowed me to get my foot in the door. Um, it gives me a bit of breathing space while I'm, I'm um, securing a longer term fellowship and will allow me to generate any um, additional preliminary data that I might need for applications. Um, so as it stands, um, I'm waiting to hear back. Um, so I, I, after I came back from maternity leave, I submitted my application and I'm now waiting back to, to hear about the outcome of, of that decision. Um, that was kind of a bit different because of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, um, yeah, so I actually began my group um, at King's a week after lockdown, so I kind of feel like I haven't fully transitioned and I'm kind of still waiting to get going, but it's allowed me, this kind of lockdown has allowed me time to, to, to focus on these, on these fellowship applications. Um, my main advice with going down the fellowship route would be to give yourself loads of time. The, um, the fellowships all follow the kind of same um, deadline pattern. So there'll be uh, like one in autumn, one in spring. Um, so you can predict, you know, two years ahead when you would be expected to submit at the different stages. So give yourself loads of time. Life throws up unexpected events. Um, like my baby arriving early wasn't expected, but because I built in this this buffer time and I was still on my postdoc contract, it was kind of it was OK to 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 deal with that. Um, also, on that note, I was kind of uh, nervous about communicating to, to people and to the funders that I was pregnant and that I was going on maternity leave. But in my experience, everybody was super supportive. 
um, when I had to defer my application to the welcome, there was no problem with that. Uh, immediately they said I could submit it whenever I was I was ready, whatever call I decided I was ready for for that. Um, but also as well as giving yourself lots of time to allow for these kind of unexpected events. Um, I don't know how many reiterations of of drafts I went through um, and I gave my draft to my fellowship application draft to everybody. I gave it to probably about 20 different people from different backgrounds. So I was able to get many, many different insights um, and um, kind of cover all all bases. Um, and yeah, so yeah, definitely my main advice is give yourself loads of time. And um, in terms and, and uh, in terms of these kind of fellowship applications, uh, another piece of advice is to find out the so the institute that you're applying to or that you're applying um, for them to be your host institute, find out what their specific internal deadlines and procedures are. So obviously the, the funding body will have their deadline, but usually within an, a university, they have their own separate deadline that is um, a couple of weeks ahead of that, that, that you will be required to submit um, so that, that it can go through all of their approvals. And it's really it's quite difficult um, when you're not in the institute to gain that information. Um, a lot of the when I was like um, on the King's website, I found that a lot of the information that I required about these deadlines was behind like the intranet. So I would suggest to contact directly the university's um, research and grants team or give them a call, see what their internal deadlines are. Um, are there any um, specific um, uh, approvals that you have to get? So, for example, if you're applying for funding for animals, do you, does that need to go through a separate uh, committee? Um, salary costings usually will have to be done by HR. Um, and also, if you can find somebody else who has been successful in the, the program that you're applying for, speak with them because they'll also have really invaluable um, kind of insider information that's not not apparent when you're when you're you're not already at the Institute. Um, another big thing that um, they don't teach you is about um, negotiating salaries. Um, so when you're applying for a fellowship, you have to negotiate with the institute what your salary will be that you will then request from the funder bodies. And I think it's kind of this um, unorganized process that you that you have to go through. And I think um, the way that I did it probably wasn't um, the optimal way. So the way that so the way that it happened for me was the person that I was dealing with asked me what my current salary was and then they would kind of benchmark what they would offer me off the back of that. Um, but I mean, you know, different institutes will have different salaries. And if you're from an institute that has a historically lower salary, you may be penalized. Um, so I would advise to um, speak with other people in the institute and from other institutes and um, how did they do it. Um, speak um, or really uh, press the people in, in finance or in HR or whoever it is that you're dealing with about how they have um, determined the salaries for other people who've been in your position. Um, because when I was applying, like they didn't take my CV, they didn't take my experience or anything like that into consideration. So I really had to press them to, to find out what was the average uh, band that other people with my my experience and background, um, what, what they were being uh, recruited in on. Um, and I think, um, yeah, this with the with the fellowship applications, I think the salary thing is something that um, it still needs to be kind of I think postdocs need to be taught uh, how to how to do this in the in the right way. Um, so as I said, I'm currently waiting. So I'm on this kind of short term fellowship and I'm awaiting the outcome of this Henry Dale. Um, my advice also would be to um, have a plan B, C, D, 
as far down as you can go. So I basically, the minute I hear the outcome of this application, if it's unsuccessful, I know exactly what the next call will be that I'll be applying for. But also I'm um, kind of positioning myself in a place so that if all of my fellowship applications fall through, um, I will make myself hopefully an attractive candidate to be hired in as a, as a lecturer, as, as a lecturer um, if a position was to become available um, at King's. Um, but obviously the benefit of going, of, of being uh, recruited in on a fellowship will be that I'll be protected from, from teaching. So I won't have to, to lecture if I don't want to. But of course, people always advise that you should get involved with the teaching because it kind of makes you, um, it makes you appear as a as a good university citizen um, and also will make you um, more attractive to be to be offered a, a permanent position um, once your fellowship has come has come to the end. Um, um, and again, uh, so another point that the organisers asked us to talk about was um, in um, about this question of impact factors and, and journals. And I think Anna um, described it quite um, accurately. I think, you know, it's it's always um, a problem that people talk about, like impact factors is is one metric of of a of a of a candidate. But I think if you can show productivity and collaboration um, if your CV shows as well like a track record of of skills that are being acquired um, you know that should also also go um, go in hand with um, your publication record um, um, in terms of um, what I think the main strengths of my fellowship application so obviously um, it's not been successful yet, but from the feedback that I got from the, the peer reviewers, they um, they said that it was it was um, that I was addressing both fundamental questions so fundamental questions of human biology, but there were also translational aims. Um, and this was um, kind of in line with what the the research body um, um, goals and objectives are. Um, I had um, I had a good amount of preliminary data to support my hypothesis, um, but I wouldn't say that I had like you know everything um, sewn up. Um, I also had a mix of safe objectives, um, so ones that it was very clear that uh, whatever the answer was, I would be able to get a publication from that, but also they would lead to more higher risk objectives. So um, kind of I will be able to ensure that I will get publications, um, maybe a, a lower impact journals, but then also there are these more um, um, uh, uh, higher impact um, um, outputs. Um, as I said, I had sent it to people from so many different backgrounds. I reached out to people at King's um, from different departments and institutes who had um, um, complementary interests and techniques that I could use um, in my research aim. So again, I was showing collaboration and um, showing that I would be able to build a network that was independent from my um, postdoc supervisors um, a, a lab and I had my own clear research um, research aim and vision um, and also for every aim I had in my program I had contingencies so if if it failed um, if whatever technique I was using turned out to be suboptimal I had at least two other um, techniques that I could apply to address the same question. Um, I had contingencies built in for if um, the model that I was using turned out to be inappropriate. Um, and I think that especially um, uh, kind of eased the reviewers minds when it came to the higher impact um, or the higher risk projects and they could see that I had thought through every eventuality. Um, so I think um, that's all I wanted to talk about in this main um, this main uh, part. But um, any questions that arise in the questions and answers session, I'm more than happy to to answer. And I'll pass on to the next speaker. Yes, yeah, for me now. Hi, 
Um, OK, great. Hi, thanks for that. Thanks, Anna and Nora. That was really interesting. I think there's going to be actually some uh, some overlap between what we uh, what we what we uh, talk about here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my route to independence, and I think that I think that it's very difficult to give advice about this sort of thing because everyone's route is sort of unique and all I know is what I've done. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about where I am and how I got there and some of the some of the details about that. Um, so um, I'm based at the Cambridge Institute for Medical Research, um, which is part of the med medical school at the University of Cambridge. So you have Cambridge and you have the medical school, then you have the clinical biochemistry department and SIMA, my institute, Cambridge Institute of Medical Research, overlaps um, overlaps clinical biochemistry in the medical school here. And um, I've got a, um, a great team of people, two postdocs, Danielle and Maria, who work in the lab. Uh, Jessica um, is a PhD student and Henderson is a master's student just finishing up. Um, and um, my core funding is from a, a Sir Henry Dale Fellowship, which um, uh, Nora was just talking about. So um, if I just, um, yeah, sorry. And so what do we um, study? Um, so I want to quickly talk about what we work on because I think it really depends on your subfield, the, the approach you take. And so I'm just going to go over that briefly. Um, I'm interested in intracellular protein trafficking, how proteins are sorted in the cell and how they reach different places in the cell and the machinery that lets them get there. In particular, I'm interested in how proteins leave the Golgi apparatus, um, which is one of the subcellular compartments and get to the plasma membrane. And so um, here's a little video. Um, using super res imaging of proteins leaving the Golgi apparatus and trafficking to the plasma membrane. And we do quantitative biochemistry, super res imaging, CRISPR engineering, cell biology, flow cytometry, proteomics to try and address these, these, this question of, of, of what's the machinery that allow proteins to move about in the cell. So how did I get to this point? So I, I grew up in England in Leicestershire and so I finished my sixth form in 2006. Um, I did my undergraduate degree in genetics at the University of Leeds and then in my third year I, I, I took a research project there and um, I became really interested in the question of cell biology and the question of protein trafficking and so I applied to do a um, PhD um, and so I applied to do that with Jürgen Deneker who had been my supervisor in that undergraduate project and so I did a, a PhD in plant cell biology. I was working on plants at the time at the University of Leeds and then at the end of my PhD I knew I wanted to carry on in research and I think I wanted to make the shift to mammalian cells for various reasons um, partly funding partly because of, there were loads of cool new tools that were being available in mammalian cells for example CRISPR um, and so then I made the switch to um, mammalian cell biology and I moved to the lab of Juan Bonifacino at the National Institutes of Health in the USA and then in late 2018 I made the shift here to Cambridge and so I started my group here and so that's been going on now for uh, coming up to two years or a year and a half um, and so um, it's been a, a it looks like a pretty straightforward route through however it's not as it wasn't as simple as it looked so I'm just going to talk now about the actual transition period for me which was it started off um, so it started off in early 2017 and I applied to a lectureship position at a UK university um, and so um, this was probably um, a little bit early but there was a position at a university that I, um, that I that I really liked the department there and I wanted to apply there and so I applied and um, I was shortlisted um, for the interview interviewed and was unsuccessful and um, they rang me up and they said, look, you know, um, we think that you'll probably be better off applying for a Henry Dale application or a, a, another fellowship and we'll be happy to sponsor you for that. And so um, that sounded perfect to me. So I decided to start my Dale application at that point. Uh, and these timings are approximate, but it was around then. Um, and then my partner um, took a job in Cambridge. And so she moved um, from London to Cambridge. At the time, I was in the States. And so um, during this time, um, I had this was a sort of drastic change in where I wanted to be location wise, and um, it made it very difficult to think about the 
former university. Um, I was then awarded the Dale. Um, I think it was at the end of 2018 or maybe early uh, early 2018 or end of 2017. I was awarded the Dale, um, but then I realised I would need to move it because it was just a life choice that I, I had to make. And that was a sort of difficult decision. And so I got in contact with the first university and explained to them my reasoning. And to their credit, they had been incredibly supportive throughout the whole process, which was key. And they were also really supportive about this and they understand that life is sort of complicated. And so um, I got in touch with um, the department here, Cambridge Institute for Medical Research. Um, I then had to re-interview here. So I flew over, I was in the States at the time, remember, I flew over, um, did the interview, did the chalk talk, did the, the meetings uh, and was offered the position here. I could then was allowed to move my DL here. I had to speak to then to the Wellcome Trust and get that done and they were cool about it as well. Um, I wouldn't recommend this sort of stressful route, um, but I think that um, as uh, Nora pointed out, life is a sort of complicated reality and um, things happen that are outside of your control and usually people are pretty understanding about that. Um, if you're honest and I was honest throughout and I think that's really important as well. If you have a complication, just be honest and people understand that life is complicated. Um, so I was thinking about routes to independence in the UK to my mind and um, I think that a lot of the routes aside from the tenure track positions in a core funded institute, um, a lot of the research heavy routes require a host department support and so I was I was thinking, what, what is it that you would look for to consider in a host department? And these are the, the important things that I would consider um, to be important in a host department from my perspective. I think that it's important to have a sort of thematic compatibility. So what I mean by that is if you're someone who's very, very translational, then I think it's good for you to be in a place that is like that. If you're someone who's doing fundamental cell biology, I think it's good for you to be in a place like that. And that's just an example about translational versus not. And there are lots of things where I think just having a, a having people who understand your perspective on science around you is really important when you're a junior, a junior investigator in a department. Um, I think it's important to go to a place that has a supportive faculty um, with a good reputation, of people who are in your field. Um, I'm really lucky here because I have an incredibly supportive faculty. Everyone is really really supportive they'll read my grants they will sit down with me give me advice if i need it they'll tell me what grants to apply for what grants not to apply for they'll be honest with me they'll help me draft papers they'll you know and and i think that all that stuff is really really important because these guys have been doing it for years and they know way more than i do and so having their support is absolutely crucial um it's nice to go well it's essential to go somewhere that has the facilities that you need for your project so uh, I want to do proteomics, so I came somewhere that had a good proteomics facility and I wanted to do super resolution imaging, so I came somewhere that had the scopes that I needed to do that. Um, and it's also nice to have somewhere that has internal funding. Um, this matters particularly for PhD students. It's sort of tricky to get PhD students, which I think uh, is a good thing to, to have in your group. Um, if your department has, for example, a Wellcome Trust PhD programme, that's fantastic. Um, and it's also a good to be in a place that attracts good candidates, that has a reputation for the research that you're interested in doing. I think that's important. And I think it, it sort of helps to bolster you towards success. Um, and finally, of course, you have life choices and sometimes geography is more than the things of, that I've listed above, but you just have to be in a certain city. And um, that's just as important, right? Because we're, we're, all, we're all humans. Um, and so why do I think my application was successful? Well, I don't really know. Um, why I think it might be is because I have a track record of published research in what I wanted to do. So I demonstrated the things that I wanted to do that I had these skills. Um, I think that um, I spent a long, long, long time thinking through my application. I made as many people read it as could. I got loads of support for that. I admitted the problems that with my application, its weaknesses. I didn't try to, to plaster over weaknesses with the application. I tried to focus on broad scientific questions. And as Nora said, I had contingencies in and backup plans and sort of experiments that should work. Now, even experiments that should work don't always work, but it's good to have these setups. Um, and a strong letter of support. And I think that's really important as well to have strong letter of support, both from the 
post institute and from your former supervisor. And I think having these, I think it matters. Um, and so the, the, the final the final couple of points I want to make is, first of all, how did I choose my project? I think this is this is something that that, that people don't always think about as much as I think they should, because I think that people start off with a too narrow perspective on what they might want to do. And so what I tried to do was I took a step back because I'm, I was a postdoc at the time and I was like in the in the zone, you know, and so I took a step back and I and I just took a notebook and I just started thinking about the largest questions in the field to my mind, like what are the big open questions in the field? And I just wrote them down and I had like a big list of them and I would like run them by people and people would say, oh no, that's that's sort of been solved or um, oh yeah, but that's really hard. And I would sort of think about each one. I ended up with a list of about five to 10, a sub list of, of what I think are genuine questions. I still have that list. And I decided to choose one and I tried to, and, I, and, I, and the one I chose, I decided to do by ranking them by the following criteria. Number one, is it answerable? Is there a way that this question can be physically answered? Sometimes we just don't have the tools to answer the scientific questions we have. Number two, do you possess the skills and is there evidence that you possess the skills to solve this scientific question? And number three, does it fit the narrative of your career to start to address this question? What, what do I mean by that? What I mean by is I think that the narrative of your career is like a story that you write about your past um, that leads to the place where you're going to go and it should be the most obvious flow through ever and I think that it's important when doing this to demonstrate a history of independent thinking that you're the you're the master of your own fate and so um, I've got this excerpt here from my from my Henry Dale and and and, and this is where I was sort of trying to do this where I was I was trying to demonstrate that I wasn't just floating about looking for postdocs where they would take me or I didn't just want to go to America because I thought America was a cool place to be. I did it because, you know, I, I said that um, simultaneously mammalian cell biology was having many mini revolutions with novel technologies such as imaging, genomic engineering and life cell trafficking assays. In addition, the relationship between protein trafficking and human neurodegenerative disease was starting to become clear. So to address these questions that interested me and utilize these technologies, I joined this lab. And so what I'm what I'm trying to do there is trying to demonstrate that I, I, I sort of made this choice actively. And I think that's important. Um, so I've sort of used up a lot of time, but um, coming to the, the closing comments, the final thing that I want to say that's really important, probably the most important thing, which is everybody is unique. Everybody is absolutely unique. You do not have to take any of the paths that anybody today tells you about. You do not have to, you do not have to do the things in that way. Some of the best scientists I know, seriously the best scientists I know, uh, field defining scientists have taken a non-traditional path to independence and done it in their own way in their own time and so I, I don't think there should be any pressure to do this in this certain way um, and finally please feel free to get in touch with me if you want to speak through any of this stuff or anything I've said today you can either dm me on twitter or just email me at my at cam email address and I'll be more than happy to have a chat with you or reply to your emails and just thanks to everyone for listening I'm going to pass it on So hello, yeah, the next one should be me. Um, let me share my screen. Is this visible now? No. No. Oh, let's see. Perfect. Yeah, it's nice work. Right. Right. OK, um, yeah, thanks for the organizers for inviting me uh, to give this talk today. My name is Philip Schiffer. I'm um, a PI or junior group leader at the University of Cologne in Germany now, and I'm uh, working on my lab is the warm lab. Um, so you can actually um, look us up on the Internet and uh, find our homepage to get more information about all the science we plan to do. Um, I will touch back on this in a, in a second. Um, yeah, so my funding is uh, is from the German Science Foundation and it's the Emmy Neuter program. Um, and I will also give some more details on this later. Um, however, what I want to do now is like, um, I think many things have already been said um, and I guess there would be about um, 
how you do this transition and what you need to think of and how you frame your grants and um, applications. And, um, but um, there's one question, right? So uh, why do you want to become a PI in the first place? And um, do you really want to do it? Um, because it's kind of like, it's a life choice, I guess. Um, and, and maybe for many people, it's actually not, not the thing to do. Um, because you have to, uh, well, it's tricky to to become a PI, and then of course there are also concessions to your um, to your general life. Um, for me, I think when I was uh, ninth or tenth grade in school, um, I decided to become a professor and cure uh, HIV or something. Um, then I started to uh, study biology in um, Cologne in Germany um, and um, became more and more interested in evolutionary biology and paleontology and so my first um, work when I really kind of um, did this like I think in, in the English system would be a master thesis so fast it was a diploma. I actually worked on, on goose barnacles um, and I think after that it's no more curing HIV it's it's evolution um, and for my um, PhD then um, I, I went to nematodes and, and this switch to nematodes was really by chance, right? So I wanted to stay at the University of Cologne. Um, and um, I was very lucky uh, to find a funding scheme um, in Germany where you could actually apply for money uh, as a PhD student, which is really rare. Um, and so I got my own research money and I ended up uh, being associated to a lab working on nematodes. So I started working on nematodes and became really fascinated. Um, and um, one thing that I realized early on was um, that um, you have to do something which is um, maybe not super daring, but, but cutting edge and new. And so I went into genomics and transcriptomics um, and started to really uh, establish myself in this field. And it, this was during this time of the revolution to second uh, generation sequencing. Um, and by having my own grant, I actually could, um, could do things that other people couldn't do at that time. Um, and so maybe even got an edge already then. Um, I stayed a bit longer in, in Cologne and then also moved on uh, to the EMBL and I did something which some people might say is kind of like um, not so good. I branched out and I branched out massively. So I started working uh, already during my PhD and then also during the postdocs in all kinds of weird different organisms. So I had this nematode system but now I also did fish and I worked on rotifers and uh, cnidarians uh, and even more different animals. I never touched on plants for whatever reason, um, but I branched out into all these different uh, different fields and, and never really had this uh, this core focus or not, um, not actually during this time. Um, so afterwards I, um, I um, became a senior postdoc at UCL in London and um, my main project was um, on a little different, a little worm actually, a marine worm, which is called Cynophobella bocchi, um, which uh, is closely aligned with the acyl. So the red worm um, in the, at the bottom of this slide is, is an acyl. And uh, then I also worked on some weird parasites like Intosia to the left here. Um, and, and again, different organisms. So the only thing that you could really say is that uh, that I became kind of the warm person. So because I worked on nematodes and then all these different warm type animals, but it's kind of really a, a very diverse and, and, and not focused area of research. Um, and then of course, like you do your senior postdoc and the next step is, uh, is establishing yourself with a group. Um, and, and the question is how to do this, right? Um, I had already during my, my, my postdoc years at, at UCL written, I don't know, like 10, 15 applications for different uh, uh, professorships or lectureships in, um, well, in Germany and also in the UK. I never got invited. Um, then um, my funding at UCL ended. Um, I, I got lucky and uh, became kind of a replacement for uh, somebody who went on a sabbatical. Uh, which, which was very good for me because I could carry on and, and finish my grant applications. Um, and the first thing I tried is actually um, go to Switzerland. Um, and again, this is kind of a curious story because my um, the topic I had in mind then is different from the one um, which I ended up writing my grant about. And the story there is that um, that the topic I wanted to do 
was actually already addressed, although in different organisms, by a professor who um, was long established at this institution in Switzerland. And she just said, like, you know, if, if you write this grant this way, they would say, oh, no, he's doing the same as she is doing, and so why should we fund him? Um, and so in the end, I wrote a grant which is um, which was more Evo Devo focused um, away from this topic I had in mind. Uh, it fitted to what I had done previously, of course. It, that's a different story. I will tell in a second. You can't do something completely new, but I, I established something which um, well, I wrote a grant um, in, in on a topic which I hadn't originally planned uh, planned to do. Um, so this Ambiciona Fellowship would have given me my position and a PhD student and about like uh, I think 400,000 Franken um, for about four years or something. So that that's kind of the range of the um, of this fellowship. Um, this one failed, so I had one referee and he didn't like it, or she, I don't know. Um, so they said it's it's um, not good enough, I'm not excellent enough, and so so I didn't get this, this funding. Um, so I decided to try something completely different um, and uh, went for the Henry Dale, which we already heard about, um, and there I, um, I actually wanted to do something really new and different, which I hadn't published on. So uh, this would be working on parasitic nematodes, and trying to um, to address some um, human health issues there, um, and um, I got really good reviews uh, from two of my referees for this grant, but three of them said only it's only competitive, um, so I wasn't invited for interviews. Um, at the very same time, I was interviewed for a professorship uh, in one of the Nordic countries, uh, which was a really good experience, and um, it's something which. Um, I think really helps you. So if you go to an interview um, and I um, actually prepared uh, also through um, UCL's uh, human resources department, which help you preparing for interviews, this is really, really helpful uh, because once you did this one time, uh, you know how things run and get a feeling for what, what questions might be asked and, and how all of this is set up. And of course, you also gain some, uh, some confidence. Uh, anyway, from the five persons which are shortlisted, they, they uh, picked somebody else. Um, they said it was very close, um, so I don't know, uh, but um, certainly the person that was picked in the end was really excellent. So um, I think she, she will be an excellent professor, really. Um, right, and so then um, actually I had one last shot left um, because um, at that point um, this um, Aminator program back in Germany was really almost the last option for me to to stay in science or to transition to the PI level. I mean, I, you can always stay in science as a, um, as a postdoc forever, uh, but the question is if you want to do this um, or then maybe do something else, right? Um, so for this uh, emulator program, um, I went back to this original Ambiciona grant and actually extended it. Um, so the Ambiciona grant would have been for four years, as I said, that had given me one PhD student. Uh, with the Aminator, which I eventually got, uh, I have a postdoc for four years and two PhD students for four years uh, and considerably more money than the Ambiciona would have given me. Um, in this, I had two reviewers, which were really kind of, they liked the um, proposal, both of, both of them. Uh, more or less one comment I got is um, the number of my um, first order publications um, might have or could have been higher. That's what one of the reviewers said. Uh, but that's maybe the only critique, right? Um, so there is something about having enough papers, but that's also for, for example, if you want to go for Henry Dale, my institution, um, um, in London and also the Welcome Trust suggested that you have a certain number. They, they even checked my, my uh, publication list and uh, to confirm that I have enough publications. So it's always um, a number. I think um, from my feeling is that um, in general institution uh, or funding bodies go away from the impact factor. So they, they look more like um, the number of publications as first author or in where you are on the authors list and and maybe even the content or let, let the reviewers uh, judge on the content. And um, I think luckily there's a move away from impact factor because obviously that's like it, something that needs to be scratched from science. Um, so this is more or less my way. 
and then I wanted to give some some kind of um, side advice um, of things that that I try to do, and I think that are very uh, are very very helpful and are still very helpful. Um, so the first thing is that I think you need to find good teams and good supervisors. Um, I guess most people here listening will be postdocs, so you you already did your PhD, so for your Postdoc times, find a good team, find a good supervisor, people who uh, like to work with you and people who, who push you. I listed two of my supervisors here, which were really uh, super helpful and super excellent and, and, and helped me a lot and, and still support me to this day, uh, which I'm very happy about. And uh, that's something um, you should really do because I think nobody can do this on their own. So the next thing would be, um, do something unique and distinct. And I think this also was already mentioned. And for me, this was certainly going into genomics and transcriptomics when people were only really starting to do this and, and I um, got into it. Uh, at the same time, I think for most grants, um, you fail or have a more likely, like, higher likelihood to fail if you do something which is super risky. Um, so be unique, be distinct, but don't be like separated from everybody else. I guess like if you are like brilliant and have like one finding which kind of changed a little bit, that's different again. Uh, but for most of us, this uh, I think should apply. Um, and then lastly, um, which I think was super important for me, and that's also, of course, because I'm doing so many different things, is uh, collaborating and collaborating openly, sharing data, working with many people and, and make friends here and there, right? So my only, um, yeah, I gave this list of different countries I applied in it. That was obviously because I knew people there who were willing to support me, who were willing to, uh, you know, like go to their dean or um, the faculty in their department and, and say, okay, I know somebody who uh, who wants to come here and, and, and he is really good and, and we should support him, right? Um, and this only works um, if, if you collaborate with people and, and be open and really make these connections. Again, if you're sitting in, in your office, you might do really brilliant science on your own. But if nobody knows you and, and nobody is your friend, then I guess it's very hard to find a place where they will take you. I'm again listing just two people I've worked here with. I'm very fortunate. Um, good people, but um, there are so many out there, of course, you can connect to. So, um, yeah, so this was my my way, really, and um, I truly believe there is not one way. So I think that's also become clear from the previous uh, from the previous talk, right? So I, I don't know if you can really pre-plan all of this. Um, so for me, it's just like you know meandering, and then in the end, uh, um, getting lucky in a way, I guess, too. So for example, for my postdoc, I also failed with uh, with grant applications, I don't know, three or four times, different things. And um, um, it, it's a difficult story, right? Um, so um, this also means if you want to come a PI, uh, you have to um, live with the frustration and, and, and really hang in there. Um, and then um, this is something I, I wanted to um, just point to. It's, a, it's an ELIFE paper, um, and I didn't know it, so one of my previous supervisors uh, suggested it to me. And, and they kind of um, made a survey of the academic job market, and they give some, some interesting numbers. And I think everybody should, should read this um, and then consider. Um, because it, it's a tough thing, right? Um, and um, if you are a PI, in the end, it's um, it's not all rosy, right? So I mean, um, so for me now, I have uh, three plus three years of funding, and afterwards, still no permanent position, right? And other people will be looking, hoping to get tenure um, or become a lecturer or something in the UK system, and then rise to the, rise to the ranks. Um, but it's not it's not easy. And then, of course. Um, it, it's, it brings many things like for me, like the um, most frustrating thing is, of course, uh, is, is having to do all this administration in the moment, which I do have to do on my own. So there's no secretary or anybody who helps me with this. Um, and it takes a lot of time away. 
Uh, on the other hand, in my grant, it's um, not um, planned that I do much teaching, but I really like teaching. So now I was lucky enough to, to be able to, uh, to get a course which I can, can teach. So I'm happy about this. Um, but there are, of course, some downsides also, right? And, um, and it's a lot of work to get there. And then if you are there, it's not like uh, suddenly everything is super nice, right? Um, so yeah, what I really want to say is, um, I guess this it's a winding path and you really have to uh, consider, do I want to do it? And um, what do I get personally from it? Yeah, with this, I'm, I'm, I'd like to end and um, give it on to the next one. Uh, Ines, I think you're muted. In my life now. Great. Hi, my name is Ines Skaira. I'm a lecturer at Queen Mary University. And first of all, thanks for the invitation to share my experience on how to become a PI in academia. And I would like to congratulate you for creating the London uh, Postdoc Network. I think it's a great initiative and uh, the talks that you're organizing, uh, I think, is going to be very helpful for for the postdocs. Um, so for this talk, the network gave me a list of questions that they would like to discuss, and I hope I will cover all these topics, even though a lot of the um, other uh, PIs already covered some of the um, topics that I that I'm um, addressing. Um, and I realize that we do have a, a complementary, well, kind of a different uh, backgrounds, path, uh, as well as the places where we ended up. Um, so first I'm going to give you an overview of my career. Um, I started uh, my university studies in Lisbon, where I studied for a biology degree. And uh, during my degree, I joined the um, Universi Université Libre de Bruxelles in Belgium as an Erasmus student. I then moved to Paris, where I did my master's in development biology and um, I worked for one year and a half uh, in the lab uh, studying muscle development. That was where my scientific career truly started and I have contributed for a few publications to the lab uh, during that time. Um, after my uh, master's, I was awarded a PhD fellowship from the Portuguese Research Council to pursue my studi studies in Paris. And um, I joined um, Institute Pasteur for my PhD. And then I got interested in, um, in studying uh, stem cell behavior. Um, and so I was studying hair follicle regeneration uh, and specialized in stem cell biology. And by the end of my PhD, which was actually quite a long one for uh, UK standards, I got a research grant that allowed me to continue my work, uh, paying my salary as a postdoc. And we also hired a mathematician with whom we worked to develop new tools for image analysis and to study uh, stem cell behavior. And I truly enjoyed my time in Pasteur, the community and the different resources that we had available, particularly um, imaging at the time. And I then decided to look for a postdoc abroad and I joined the lab of uh, Professor Fiona Watt. And by the time I interviewed, the lab was still in Cambridge. Um, and then I waited for uh, a few months until they moved to London to join already in the new lab at King's College London. Um, and after we published the first first offer paper from my postdoc, that's when I started to go around, present my work and look for a for a PI position. And at the end of my postdoc, I was contacted by L'Oreal in Paris for a position to be the head of their uh, research lab um, in skin aging and to help shaping a, a new department. So there's gonna, there was happening, there was a big restructuration happening in in um, in the um, uh, uh, R&D uh, department uh, in Paris, and they needed someone with my set of skills. And I couldn't say no to this opportunity, especially because. Even if I had a few interested in my CV for an academic position, there was no official offer on the table when I got this offer. 
And it was a fantastic experience to be able to manage a team of eight very talented researchers in an industry environment, learning a lot of new techniques. Um, I was contributing to the strategic pl uh, planning of of the company, of the company, no, but of the of the department, uh, to the orient orientation of the future projects. I was um, involved in technology watch. watch um, coordinating the contributions from different research hubs in the States, in Singapore, in China, and I was managing a, a big team and budget. Uh, and I am now back in academia. I've set up my research lab at Queen Mary University. I have a, and I have a, a lectureship position uh, and secured the good startup uh, package uh, uh, for my lab. Well, not one million uh, packages that they offer in the States, but um, uh, I got a package funded by the Bart's charity. And I'm very pleased with my choice for my new lab and the environment where I'm working. Um, I'm truly um, enjoying the exchanges with the colleagues and the freedom that we have in academia. But in parallel, and because it's difficult to make choices in life and because we can have wear several hats at the same time, I've actually created a consulting company to provide uh, scientific uh, advice to industrial partners. And this has given me the opportunity to develop my own lab whilst maintaining a close relationship with the industry and sharing the best of both worlds at the end. So now, um, what do you think what is was crucial for me to to get this position there's a very interesting book that is called uh, what got you here won't get you there that tells you that what you've learned throughout all your career at the point that you're deciding to be a pi is probably not the set of skills that you need to actually be a pi uh, and the first piece of advice that i would have to tell you is network it's super important to develop a, a good network and a, a set of skills um, that are not just your technical uh, technical skills. Throughout my career, I was involved in a lot of different organizations. So I was in the direction of the Young Researchers Association um, in Pasteur Institute. I created, um, I helped created creating a Young Researchers in Life Science Consortium, which kind of puts together all the um, uh, uh, Parisian um, uh, young researchers in, um, uh, associations and we had an ad annual meeting uh, that became quite of uh, with an increasing uh, pro uh, budget over time um, I created the um, association for um, research Portuguese researchers uh, in in France um, when I joined Kings I um, took over the organization of the um, series of um, seminars called stem cells at lunch and actually uh, got funding to launch the podcast for science uh, for public for science outreach called stem cells at lunch digested if you guys never heard about it it's still live so uh, please um, go on itunes and you can follow it and more recently um, i joined uh, forces with people at ucl the creek institute imperial um, uh, and queen mary uh, when I was still at uh, King's actually to uh, create the London Stem Cell Network and all these uh, uh, association, all this um, allowed me to get involved with the strategy discussions for, for example, building a new, um, a new um, uh, building at, in the Institute, meeting the scientific direction of the Institute, meeting with politicians and ambassadors, getting involved in uh, with policymakers. Um, meet senior figures in the field, um, get experience in organizing uh, conferences, handling budgets, contact sponsors, and most importantly, organize, helping organizing the beer hours that at the end is a fantastic place to network uh, with your colleagues and, and, uh, and start collaborations uh, with other departments. And this provided me with an opportunity to develop all these soft skills that we forgot that we have we forget that we have and are so important uh, for our career. Another uh, advice that I would have is be collegial. And uh, Philippe was actually uh, actually uh, telling about this point. Help your colleagues. They will be your future collaborators. They will invite you to give talks and write a paper or a review, contribute to a book. Actually, they will be the ones telling you about a job opening in their department. And that's going to be 
super super important for for your future um, career and plus projects are much more fun if you work together pushing each other in hard times and brainstorming together so i truly believe this is one of the most important things in in our job another advice that i would have is get a mentor find someone to whom you can talk about your career revolution someone that uh, gives you advice on the next steps that can um, coach you to prepare for your job interviews um, i chose a, a young pi not in my department but not too far so that she could still be familiar with my situation she's someone very easy to talk to very frank and direct which i truly appreciate and that will challenge me and push me forward and the reason why i choose a young pi and not a well-established professor is because all the processes on how to become a PI and current available funding was still very fresh for her. And so she could um, advise me uh, accordingly. Finally, uh, try to create your own team. Try to develop a, a, a team while you're a postdoc still. If your PI gives you that opportunity to supervise a student, to build up your own team, you will learn so much more um, on how to manage that team. Um, and at the end of the day, that is going to be a big part uh, of your PI job. So you would learn some management techniques, learning how to deal with uh, different personality styles, adapt your management style to the different personalities. Uh, you learn how to take the best of each person, how to take the best of yourself with each member of the team how to learn how to delegate and how to be patient because actually maybe as a postdoc you work much quicker than than a student that is just learning so you have to be patient and as a pi you also have to to be patient and and know how to share your passion passion for your science and um at the end you also need to learn how to provide support uh and uh career development for the people in your team so the first um the first picture is was the team that I, was the, the two students that work with me when I was in the lab of Fiona Walt. The two pictures in the middle are from my team in L'Oreal and the picture on the right hand side is of my uh, current um, research assistant uh, in the lab. And well, I started the lab in January and she arrived beginning of March. And actually, this was the first time that we had the lab ready up and running uh, to start experiments and we stopped uh, two weeks later but we'll go back soon um, another thing that i would like to advise you is that if you have the chance attend um, a leadership course not only it will look good in your cv but it will provide you a set of skills to better manage your team so i really found that it was a, a perfect moment to step back and give yourself um, uh, time to reflect about your leadership style, how you deal with your team, how you develop your interpersonal skills, um, how to pitch a vision, a vision for, your, for your team, and basically thinking about the big picture. I know that EMBO offers um, a very good training for their fellows, and you can also attend if you, even if you don't have an EMBO fellowship. At King's College, there was also a couple of very good training for free on leadership. And by the way, the, this picture on the slide is it was taken from uh, one of the these courses. Um, and uh, if you work in the field of dermatology, I strongly recommend to attend to the Academy of uh, Future Leaders in Dermatology and their uh, follow up um, leadership and mentoring course. Um, depending on where you are applying or where you are looking for a PI position, you may be asked to have some teaching experience. Uh, we have all done uh, some teaching um, either on outreach events or uh, a few lectures at the university and uh, I've even helped uh, set up a summer school on stem cells at King's and coordinated a model but at the end of the day you need to prove that you have teaching experience and if you're applying for a lectureship at UK I would suggest that during your postdoc you could apply to become a fellow in, uh, in the higher education academy and for that, you need to attend some courses uh, and write an essay about your teaching experience. Um, and most of the universities uh, pay for it. Um, 
Um, so this will prove that you have teaching experience and actually it will also save you from having to do a PGCAP training do you, during the probation of, of your lectureship. Now, location, how to choose the right location for your future lab. When you're looking for a position, is very a very important thing is to pick the right location. And for that, you have to think about what you want to do and what you need to do to do that. Um, so you have to, as it was said before, you need to make sure that you have all the facilities and equipment available for the experiments you, you, you need to do. But also very important is the scientific environment where the lab is going to be. Do you have good interactions with your colleagues? Do you feel supported? And what are the collaborations that you foresee with your colleagues? Um, also, how can you attract people for your lab? For your lab? Do, do they have already PhD programs that you, 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 you can um, uh, get students from? Um, if you have administrative or technical support available, um, if you have access to clinical samples in case you need, that was something important for me. That's why I decided to go to one of the places that as a, um, a working in oral cancer, there's a lot of um, people with um, oral cancer that attend to the Royal uh, London Hospital and, uh, the, and that's where we're based at Whitechapel. And then also looking at the teaching load, um, whether you have a lot of teaching load uh, or not. And finally, look at the, the space offered, the startup funds that you're offered for, for, for to start your uh, lab, uh, the tenure success rates and what are the perspectives in career evolution, whether you get a, a lectureship and then you can stay in the same uh, um, university, but then can you evolve or actually have to move to change and get a better position? And then, of course, um, your family arrangements. And what about the impact factor? Well, this is the one dollar, one million dollar question, right? How important it is, uh, the impact factor of your publications. And I'm not going to lie. We all know that at the end of the day, it is important, but it's not essential. I've seen people with no papers in high impact journals getting PI positions, and I've seen people with natures not being able to, 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 to get a, um, a position. It does not rely on your papers, but also on your projects, on your network, on your skills and what actually you can bring to the new departments. So uh, the research productivity is not a sine qua non, but you and it can take many forms. So you can either, either have two glamour uh, publications in very high impact journal or you can have eight uh, solid contributions. I have no first author paper in nature, in cell or science, but I have a consistent track record. And when I was hired, it was at the moment where you universities were playing this game of musical chairs. So where people are hired to not to in a way to boost the ref of the department. So and I've seen a lot of examples of people being able to negotiate great packages to bring their recently published natures or science. Of course, this is more in a professorship uh, level, but it's still important for assistant professors. So bottom line, you do not need to have a big impact paper to secure a position that helps. But it is more important what you can bring to the department, how you can collaborate with your colleagues and what you have to offer. And then in terms of fundings, wh when you apply to new positions, you're not only selling the scientific skills and what you can bring to the department, or the number of papers you rec recently published, you are also uh, you also can see how much money you can attract. It all became a business. So if you already have an ERC starting grants, for example, waiting for you, I'm sure that you will be very competitive and will have several institutions interested in hiring you. Don't forget that at least 20% of your grants would be used to pay the university overheads. But realistically, most of us won't get an ERC. And uh, we need to prove that we are able to secure other funding for our lab and university. So I would advise that throughout your PhD and postdoc, apply for your own fellowships, apply to small project grants. This will give you a bit more freedom. Uh, you'll have extra pots of money to hire a student or a technician to help you and show that you are proactive and able to secure funding. And in terms of uh, types of fundings really depends on where you're applying to. You had a fantastic 
description uh, in the, with the last talks about the different types of fundings that you, you can apply and to where. Uh, but my advice is to start early and uh, make sure you have some funding uh, before before you start uh, your PI position. The main challenges and diffic difficulties that I found was to understand this jargon on grants, the budget uh, paperwork that you need to, especially if you do um, uh, work with uh, NHS and human samples and if you work with uh, do animal work, the dif differences between full economical cost or char charities, fundings that don't pay the full economical cost, the overheads, all this is quite difficult to, to understand. So you need to know who to ask for help. And um, another challenge is that you need to have enough preliminary data when you start applying, but you need to be different from your supervisor. So you have to find your niche. You have to be unique, uh, but uh, also experienced in uh, in what you've done. So uh, uh, experienced to do that uh, novel project and it all takes a lot of time. So plan ahead. One of the things I also miss, and this was a slide that I've stolen from um, another talk um, is doing actually doing science. When you are a postdoc, 80% of your time you're focusing on your on your project. And when you get a lectureship position or uh, you would split your time between teaching, between administrative tasks, between setting up all the risk assessment, all the paperwork that you need for your lab and not enough time uh, to do science. So this is one of the main uh, difficulties, I would say. So overall, there's no recipe to become a PI. It really depends on your skills, on your CV, on the place that you like to be. But one important thing is that you need to develop a research identity, a coherent and recognizable path that is unique to yourself and that equips you with that set of projects that are realistic but inter and interesting. We all know that the success rate in grants is low, so you have to be perseverant. You have to toughen up, as they say, don't take it personally and keep positive. Get feedback on your applications and uh, for your job interviews. Ask help to your colleagues and mentors and the members of your network that are not specialized in your field. And don't forget that papers are not all. Throughout your career, you, are developed, you have developed a set of soft skills that are essential for your success. Go out there, talk to people, give talks and introduce yourself because people need to know that you're in the job market when you're ready. And finally, be passionate about what you do. And with that, I will leave you with two pieces of reading, one that was published in Nature recently on um, what to do when you have your grant rejected. It's quite, quite a, a good reading and a, a book on how to set up your lab that gives you lots of advice on how to interview your staff, how to organize your lab, etc. And um, feel free to contact me. Here are my contact details and I'll be really happy to discuss on the Q&A right, that is going to follow. Great. Uh, thank you very much to all the speakers for really like giving pers your personal views on uh, and your journeys about becoming uh, PIs. Um, so just for the attendees, the way we're going to proceed now uh, is so we got because we got many uh, questions on the Q&A tool. Um, I will have to pick um, the questions with the most likes. So please. Uh, right you can do right now is uh, for the attendees try to put as many likes as you want on the questions so I will be able to, to choose the one that are uh, triggering the, 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 the most interest. Um, so the first one I will pick um, is from an anonymous person but uh, nevertheless um, will be what happened to any colleagues that did not make it to independent positions as you guys have what kind of careers did they go on to do um so if any of you guys want to take that question or maybe anna since you've been uh, non a non-talking uh, speaker for a while <laughs> you can <laughs> take off 
Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I think it's it's all about perspective, right? So obviously a lot of people that I have known throughout my PhD and postdoc have gone on to do a, a lot of really cool things. So I don't think staying in academia is like the best thing or the best option for everybody. Um, so I guess a lot of my friends have, uh, I guess I know people that have gone to startups or even like bigger pharma companies um, or, you know, still work in, in science as more like research scientist positions. Um, I don't know, there's there's a lot of options out there. I, yeah, some people that have gone into publishing, there's, there's really quite a few job options um, even when you're graduating with a PhD. So I think it's good to consider everything. It's not just becoming a, a PI. Great. Uh, anybody else has uh, an insight for us? So I think there are always people who tend to hang around at universities in the hope that they will at one point eventually secure a PI position. Um, and it's very important for you to um, realize if you want to do want to be this 50 something person on the three year contract or if you want to be the 35 or 40 year old person who uh, develops something new, right? Um, so there are people who try to become a PI and just hang on and hang on and hang on. I've seen quite a few of those. Anybody else, maybe? Yeah, I, uh, I, I, um, I agree with what Anna said about, you know, you have people in industry, um, people carrying on on other postdoc careers, people going to editor work. And I think there's plenty of opportunities out there and the, it's not a route towards, science isn't a route towards PI. That's not, that's not what science is. Um, it's there's many different things out there and you know there's loads of downsides of being independent and the upside is the ability to be scientifically independent and if you really value that then you have to deal with the downsides I really value being independent I really value it and so that's why I do this but if if, if other things are important to you it's no worse to do another job of course not of course not Okay, uh, should I, should we take another question or does anybody have something to add? Uh, okay, so I can um, take another one then. Um, so one question from Alex. Um, so how do you make yourself distinct from other researchers in your field or institution? For example, an institution which has good facilities and interest in your research probably already has other researchers working in your field. Do you need to differentiate yourself from your PhD and postdoc supervisors and change field slightly? I'm happy to answer that question. Go on. Um, I, in, in my uh, experience, I found that I needed to, in a way, combine the set of skills that I had from my PhD with the set of skills that I developed during my postdoc. You need to dif differentiate yourself from your previous PI. However, what I realized from some feedback in some grant writing was that I was told that I don't have enough experience in the field. So when you try to be unique and you try to kind of be different, think a little bit out of the box and create something new for yourself. People criticize you for not having the experience to do that, but you can argue that you can actually do these um, experiments and learn new things even when you become a PI. But on the other hand, if you do something very similar to what you've done before, especially staying in the same country as your supervisor, the problem is that you'll always be on their shadow. So it's a really tricky situation to 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 decide. So that's why we were saying that you have to be unique and in a way try to find a smart way to combine what you are now with what you develop throughout uh, uh, your career to to be able to define this um, unique field for yourself and distinguish yourself from from your supervisor. Right. Thank you. Like, for example, swap organisms, right, or something. So this is easy. 
Um, so for example, in, in my case, uh, in Evo Devo, many people work with arthropods and, and, uh, and chordates. I work with nematodes. In nematodes, almost everybody works with C. elegans. I never touch C. elegans. It's just like, you know, it, 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 it's slight changes. It's, it's basically, uh, now I'm doing very similar things to what my host, so the guy who's um, uh, allowing me to work in his, uh, his lab space in Cologne what he's doing, but he's working exclusively on insects and some other arthropods and, and I'm doing worms. So it's just different enough that we can be both in the same department with similar questions, which then also kind of allows us to collaborate. But on the other hand, I'm distinctly different from him. And then also I work with a little different technique. So that's also you can shift from I don't know, you can shift from second to third generation sequencing or something, right? So this is already might be enough to make you distinct from, from other people. I think also um, developing your own independent collaborations. So seeking people in the field that your, well, your, your supervisor hasn't worked previously, because I think it's not if you have a research question that you're interested in and you're passionate about, there doesn't you don't need to change fields, you don't need to change model, but you just need to demonstrate that you will be distinct and you're not reliant on your previous supervisor guiding you. So I think, yeah, new collaborators is, is a good way to go as well. Great, thank you. Um, so shall I go on with the next one then? Um, great. Uh, so. Another anonymous question. Um, how did you know when you were ready to apply for lectureship positions or fellowship after or during a first postdoc versus going on to a second postdoc? Is this decision only based on your uh, track record, publication record, or uh, people told you so, uh, or the novelty of um, the project you're proposing? Yes, David. Um, I think that at some point for, for me, I just decided that this was a decision that I wanted to make and just to go for it because I thought that I, if I was in two minds about it for too long and I knew how long the process would take, that it would end up becoming, so it's already such a long process, like an extremely long process, like over a year, at least over a year from like, like from the moment you say like, okay, I'm going to do this, it's more than a year till you're sitting in your lab, like way more than a year, probably two years, right? And so. I don't I think it's just a moment of saying, OK, I'm just going to try it. And if you decide that you can't be in two minds about it because you would you will not be successful unless you go for it 100 percent. But I, I think that you just need to internally make that decision and commit to it. And you know what? If it doesn't work out, it's OK. Like everything's OK. It's just a job. Um, but um, I think you've just got to decide that that's that, that's what I would say to that. What, what do you guys think? I asked my supervisors and colleagues, should I apply for this professorship there and there or lectureship there and there? And they said, yeah, go for it. And that's when I started. So it's always good asking people who can like have a bird's eye view on you and can tell you where you are. I guess. Yeah, I agree with all that. I think just like there's never going to be a time when you're like, yep, I'm ready. Now is the time. I'm in such a good position. Like, I'm going to do it now. I think you just go for it when you do. If it's too early, like, you'll get rejections, but you'll get feedback. And that's also really valuable. And if you're successful, then there you go. Cool. Uh, OK, next one. Uh, I hope you're ready for it. Uh, how to protect your future ideas when seeking feedback. It happened to me before that the people I seeked help from took some of my ideas forward. Did this kind of thing happen to any of you? But it happened that people parasitized on my ideas, but on the other hand, I'm always telling everybody what I'm about to do and how I will do it. So it's kind of like, <laughs> but my field is not like it's not we are not cutting edge medical whatever science where people try to kill each other it's kind of well, at the end of the day you need to trust the people that you ask 
uh, to read your grant. So hopefully, if you trust that, <laughs> that mm. happens. Okay, cool. So I see that uh, there was no real like hard experience. Um, so uh, another one, um, but I mean, we might have covered a, a bit of it, uh, but I'll just check with you if you have anything to add. Uh, so did you consider any non-academic career options and what made you decide on following an, an academic career in the end? So maybe if you had like uh, one key decision point uh, that you can share. I mean, we know a bit uh, for Inesh, but um, maybe the others, or if, if you want to extrapolate. I considered a lot of other options for the last three years, and I'm still uh, in the process of doing side projects outside of academia or kind of which integrate into my scientific background, of course, because I can't like do something completely different, but I'm still following this. And so like for me, and I, I don't know if, if after my grant, I will get a permanent position, right? So I have to, I guess, stay open to the possibility of in, in some years needing to transition out of science, maybe, right? So, and I think everybody who is not tenured but got an offer for a permanent position will need to have side plans, I guess. Anybody else has a, wants to share like what is making them stay in academia over any other career path? Um, for me, I think it was, um, so my PhD was in placenta biology and then in my postdoc I moved to a slightly different area and gained new skills. And what I'm really, what is kind of driving me now is I have the skills and the experience to return to those questions that were annoying me during my PhD that the technologies just didn't exist at the time. So I'm, yeah, it's kind of like going back and getting these, these demons. I want to answer some of those questions. Um, I'd also say I don't have time to 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 have side projects outside of um, my job at the moment. Like, but I think that's the same. The, the, the thing with science is that you're always gaining. Um, it's it's not just the lab work. You're gaining like writing grants. That's you know, you're you're honing your skills of argument and persuasion and writing skills. These are all the soft skills that can be taken into other non-academic um, positions in the field of science. You can get involved with public engagement and again, like really always keeping your communication skills going, um, like lecturing, teaching, all those sort of things. Um, if it doesn't pan out, like, you know, people in, in finance and in law, their jobs may, their careers may not pan out in the way that they were going to go, but there's always ways to, to maneuver. I think for me, um, yeah, I've definitely considered other options. I think that's just kind of what you have to do um, when you're in science, that you always have to have a backup plan. I, I always was um, similarly interested in working in like a startup company and who knows one day maybe I will do that as well. But um, what's keeping me on this track for now is that I'm just, yeah, I, I love being at a university and working in that setting. Um, really passionate about teaching and just engaging with students and as well as just having my own lab and being able to pursue my own ideas. So I think it's definitely a luxury to be able to do this, um, but there's lots of other things that I'd be interested in doing as well. So who knows, maybe I will one day. Great, so I see that the PIs have started to answer to the questions uh, directly on the chat. Um, so maybe because we are recording them, the event, I should just try to read them and you can just briefly answer if you're not too bored about repeating yourself. Um, so uh, one was for a, a bit more specifically for uh, Inesh. Um, how would you, because you have uh, ex experience in, in the industry, how would you compare academia and industry in terms of uh, working with people? 
it seems like academia is a lonely place where you need a lot of self-motivation, but not sure how about, about the industry. Oh, Ines, I think you're muted again, sorry. Sorry, it's just that you can have a, a little boy sing, uh, crying, um, uh, screaming behind me, so I mute myself that, so that you don't have all these noises. Um, so this can be good and bad uh, in different, uh, depending on the way you look at it. Uh, I don't think that in academia uh, you'll feel alone a lonely person. You only feel a lonely person if you isolate yourself, if you work in your uh, bench alone, if you don't communicate with your colleagues, if you don't uh, go for a beer with your colleague when you have a hard day and then uh, need to discuss and brainstorm with someone else. I think uh, it's important. We are social animals and during this lockdown we all realize how much we need interaction with other people and uh, we really need to um, uh, be in contact, well, in academia, you should also be surrounded by other people and get help uh, in your projects. Um, in industry, you work as a team and you feel like a little piece uh, in the team. And what I realize is that unless you have a very high position, uh, your voice doesn't go very far. And so you don't have much freedom to develop your own projects. Uh, so you can be part of a team. Uh, there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of changes in role all the time. So you often uh, have people that are working with you start a project, but then they leave to 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 another position. So that can also be quite uh, disturbing to have such a turnover um, uh, of people. Um, uh, but yeah, it's it's great to be able to work on that team. But every time you make a decision, sh everything takes much longer because you have all these people that will take the decision uh, uh, with you. Um, so at the end, uh, and you can also feel uh, very lonely if you think that you want to take a project uh, forward and you realize that uh, there's no way you can do it because you don't feel that support. Uh, but again, you work for a, a bigger uh, company, it's not you that decides the projects that uh, are going to go forward, it's actually the market, is the, the, the money that drives it at the end. Uh, so uh, yeah, I do think that, uh, I, I disagree when you say that uh, in um, academia you feel lonely, you can only feel lonely if you don't collaborate with your peers or you don't uh, uh, find a, a buddy that I don't know a young PI, another young PI that just became PI at the same time as you is someone that you can go open the door of their office and say oh my god I got another grant rejection and someone that will cheer you up, you up for example so um, yeah that's the way I think you should hmm. kind of find this peer support okay cool thank you uh, okay, next one. Uh, I think we didn't really cover much of this. Um, do you think it is important to move institutions as you progress through an academic career or not? So maybe some of you that didn't move around so much and in the end managed to have a PA position or others that got like to hear uh, stories of other PIs that moved a lot or didn't move and how it helped. In Germany, it's essential to move. And best you move out of Germany and come back. OK, I think in France, uh, it's also very important, but it's just here today. <laughs> I think um, I think it's really important to move, actually. And um, if you don't, if you haven't moved institutions, I think it's it can still be OK, but I think you just need to rationalize it when you write about it and you need to address it so don't try and hide it just say look I haven't moved for, because I have a family or I haven't moved because of this and then seeing that I think that it's it's helpful to it's helpful to to for people to understand what what, what you're what you're doing and, and just to, to, to try and deal with it because it probably is probably something that could be could be spoken in uh, against you and against your proposal I think Okay, um, so one that uh, one question that uh, I didn't see before, which got many likes. Um, maybe we covered a bit, but I mean, out of the interest of the attendees, um, I risk to 
to repeat a bit, uh, how important was the position on the papers? Did they look if you had last author papers uh, or middle VS first? So may uh, maybe uh, I think we didn't cover much about the last author position. Is it uh, common in the in the new PIs uh, to that new PIs have published as a, a last author before um, they get um, uh, a position and uh, was it the case uh, for most of you? I think one uh, at least. Did you, did you have any? I haven't had any, I didn't have any last author papers that I'm my application and I think it would be quite rare. I know some people say it's necessary, but I think it's rare. I think it's, it's very rare and usually I think that it's a, uh, it's, it comes when it's a gift from your yeah. previous supervisor and it's, it's obvious um, for people to have true last author papers means that they've been working totally independently but how can you do that when you're a post it doesn't make any sense I think everyone's a realist and I think they're realistic about the amount of preliminary data preliminary data you need which isn't that much um, and I think they're realistic about the last author papers it's, it you know it just would count everyone out who should be getting fellowships I would yeah, think definitely you should try and be the communicating or corresponding authors on your first author paper um, or at least shared corresponding author. Um, so I tried this with all my first author papers from the very beginning um, and in one or two cases it, it didn't work out but all the projects I initiated I made the point to be the corresponding author on my first author paper. I don't know if referees kind of see this or anything but I think it's I think it's a good like a statement. This is my research. For me, I only have first authors and um, yeah, uh, co-authors. Um, any papers that I publish um, while I'm in this kind of intermediate position um, that are that's from data from my postdoc lab, I'll be corresponding author on that. But from the fellowship applications, um, it was just uh, straight up first author and uh, regular papers. Yep, same for me. This is just re repetition now, but I think it's really rare for people to be the last author on their papers. So um, by the end of my postdoc, I'll have papers that yeah, we've submitted that I'll be the corresponding author on, but um, I didn't have that at the time of application. OK, um, cool. So I think we'll take uh, one or two more questions for the sake of time. Uh, and because I mean, as you have uh, so many things to do. Um, so about the funding, uh, uh, one question was, can I ask where you found positions to apply? So on jobs.ac.uk and so Anna also mentioned uh, another website. Uh, but what about also uh, spontaneous applications like um, I think Nora made? How do you think, is it, do you think that is very common and that universities actually uh, waiting for these? And also if you have any uh, other websites to share, please uh, do. Um, I haven't found, so I've probably been um, making this transition uh, for the last four years because I had maternity leave thrown in there as well. Um, in those four years, I haven't seen any lecture positions come up that um, that would have been like my ideal position uh, to apply for. Um, but I think the websites that have been mentioned already would be good places to go to. Also, the universities themselves will have their own um, internal pages. Um, yeah, I don't have anything else to add. Oh, Ines, go ahead. Uh, I was uh, from, so I used uh, jobs.ac.uk. Nature Jobs also uh, works if you want to, I don't know, apply to Portugal, to Spain, to other places in Europe. Um, uh, I realized from from my experience, I realized that it was really important to kind of contact uh, the, the the university that you're applying for, uh, not just through the HR website, but actually contact the department that you'll be interested in. And uh, what I realized is that you can actually contact ahead a department that you think is going to be a great fit 
for your research, uh, and a place where you actually would see yourself uh, working uh, and uh, show your interest that you'd like to join them. Um, and uh, if there is a lectureship coming up or if there are some funds and they are thinking of hiring someone, they can put together a business um, case to create a lectureship for you and then you can apply for extra funding to 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 uh, back up your um, uh, start, start a package basically. OK, great. Uh, I'll take on. Um, um, so maybe two last questions. Uh, one uh, about uh, juggling between um, parenthood and uh, being a PI. Um, so maybe um, uh, Nora and Inesh can uh, tell us a, a bit about a bit more about it, but also uh, the male PI is, uh, I don't know if you have uh, kids already, so I don't want to be sexist or anything, but um, yeah, as, if you have, do you have any uh, advice and um, on how you handle this? <laughs> Maybe Inez can go first because I, I'm so position yeah. just for me was uh, in a tricky moment, meaning that uh, it's really hard to uh, decide two things at the same time in your life. Uh, but you never know when a child decides to come. So uh, you just as as your grand funding, you have to be patient. Uh, so, yeah, it's never a good time. Some colleagues I had, I had their babies during their PhD, others during their postdoc, and then they say they decrease their productivity. I found that the end of the day was a, um, I thought it was a bad timing, but it was a great timing because as Nora was saying during maternity leave, I was with my baby sleeping on my lap, writing grants. I was uh, now during lockdown on Skype meetings with mentors or collaborators with my baby on my lap and it, it, it worked. You just make it work, but it's important to have a good family support and my husband is super supportive and uh, we really share the tasks and when I'm traveling, he can uh, take care of him and, uh, and, uh, and and I'm really, we're really a team working on that. So for me, that was key. Uh, and you will find resources on you that you didn't know that you had before. And um, sleep deprivation can be quite difficult, but actually it will push you to the limit and you realize, realize that your limit is much further than you initially thought. And at the end, you also become much more productive when you're there to work, you're there to work, you have that deadline and you need to finish that whatever you're doing before the baby wakes up. And, uh, and at you become much more productive in the short amount of time that that you have. It's true that I had to say no to a lot of things like I used to do a lot of public engagement. I used to do a lot of uh, uh, other activities that I don't have the time now, but um, but uh, yeah, it, it works and you can make it work. Yeah, I definitely think you become way more efficient. Um, if you have to leave at four o'clock to do the nursery pickup, you will get everything done in that time. Um, yeah, you just make it work. I think I was saying to Ines to go first because um, I feel like I haven't I haven't got into the lab into my new lab yet. So I haven't figured out I haven't been taking on all the additional PI um, tasks as well as juggling parenthood. Um, but also there are there are lots of um, there's lots of support out there. Um, for example, um, most conferences will have um, funding that you can apply for um, to to bring somebody with you to 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 mind the child if you still need to travel with the child or to cover additional childcare costs back at home. Um, uh, during the, the COVID pandemic, there's been additional um, sources of funding uh, brought out. Um, the Society for Developmental Biology has a specific pool um, so because they've um, acknowledged that there's additional childcare costs that um, people have been taking on. And also, um, I think especially with the pandemic and with the lockdown, people have there's research um, coming out. So there's a paper in um, Nature Human Behaviour that has shown that um, the 
the brunt of childcare, uh, additional childcare, and the loss of productivity has um, fallen a lot on on female bench scientists and people. And there is a lot of discourse at the moment saying that going forward, people will need to take this into consideration. So I think on my CV going forward, when they have that little box saying, um, have you taken any uh, career breaks? I will be mentioning like I was working part time during the pandemic. You know, we, we've had a, a two year old here the whole time. Um, and I think, yeah, the com scientific community is supportive. They know that they need to they, they know that there's this massive drop off with female female PIs. So they need to support it. Um, and I know I've been talking a lot about uh, the, the female impact um, with parenthood and obviously there's additional um, considerations for, for, for fathers and um, but I can't speak from that experience. But there is support out there and um, yeah, you just you just make it work and it, it's it's good fun as well. OK, cool. Um, thank you very much. So the last question, uh, and it's going to be about your teams because PIs are nothing without their teams, obviously. This is my French sense of humor, of course. Um, so advice on um, building your team. How do you choose the right people? The, the, the only thing that um, I would I would say about this is that um, you need to get help from other more experienced people to do interviews like it's very very difficult to do a job interview for someone you think it's going to be easy but it's not and so i would i would highly advise to find some experienced people in the department and you have to do it but find some people who you trust and um, they will guide you through the interview and they will they will let you know um, uh, they will see a lot more in the candidate than you do um, and so that's the, that's that's the only thing i would say about it I have, I have, no real good advice about it because it really depends on what you know whether you're looking for someone with a lot of experience to bring new skills to the lab whether you're looking for someone who's you know uh, sort of more junior who you want to teach the skills that you're bringing it depends on your project and complicated factors that i can't discuss um, the, the, the only thing i would say is yeah just 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 make sure you uh make make sure you um you get help because it's tough i fully agree so it's like really get some experienced PI sit in on your interviews with people. Um, then um, what I did is uh, at UCL offered from the HR department actually courses on conducting scientific interviews. Um, and the other important thing I think is to standardize your interviews. So write down questions you want to ask every candidate the same questions and, and really kind of be very strict on this. Um, and then also take notes during interviews so that later on you have something that you really can evaluate uh, and, and check people against each other. And, and, and again, discuss this with the people who sat in, the experienced people who sat in on the interview. OK, um, so. Uh, I mean, on behalf of the Ed London Postdoc Network, uh, thank you very much to all the PIs for bearing with us during the technical glitch, and thank you for the attendees to trying to connect. Um, um, so we will uh, post try to post the video on YouTube as soon as possible, and you can also follow us on our different socials. So on uh, LinkedIn um, and Twitter, but also on our website, uh, LondonPostDocNetwork.com. Um, so with this, uh, if the PIs do not have anything to add, uh, I would like to wish a good evening to everybody, and uh, I hope it wasn't too long. Good luck to everyone. Yeah, good yes. luck on your future career. Yeah, mm -hmm. good luck and thanks to the organizers. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Nice to talk to everyone. You too. Thanks Bye. a lot to all Thank the you. PIs who joined us and for all the attendees as well. Thank you, everybody.